evening and welcome to The Woman Show. I'm Lenina Rasul and tonight is the first episode in a 13-part series where we'll be unpacking the issues around and drivers of gender-based violence. In 2018, the Department of Justice reported an all-time high conviction rate for sexual assault of 72.2%. Taken in isolation, those figures sound pretty good. But we wanted to take a deeper look and find out what the greater context is. What we found is that 72.2% equals 5,004 convictions, and that it's 5,004 convictions out of 50,108 reported cases of sexual assault. What does this mean? It means that roughly 10% of sexual assault survivors receive justice. It also means that roughly 90% of rapists walk free. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the drivers around sexual assault, the policy and legislation that is in place to protect women and children, and what policy and legislation is in place to deal with sexual assault perpetrators. Joining us for this discussion is Bronwyn Pippi from the Women's Legal Center. She's an advocate. We've got uh, Jennifer Smart from the Commission for Gender Equality and Annika McCracqua, who is a member of the Total Shutdown, also of the WISE Collective, as well as a member of the Steering Committee for Gender-Based Violence and Femicide. Welcome, ladies. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Bronwyn, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, as we've said before, South Africa has some of the best legislation and policy in the world to address gender-based violence, but we've also got some of the highest rates of violence against women and children. So to kick us off, we want to look at, can you give us an, or can you give us an overview of sort of what legislation is in place to protect women and children and respond to violence? Yeah. So I, as you say, I think it's very important to acknowledge that there is a lot of legislation in place. There's a lot of legislation, there's a lot of policy, there are a lot of plans, and those have been developed over time and basically have had the involvement of not only government but civil society. So I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that the process of development of law and policy in this country has been quite progressive, it's been very inclusive, and it has allowed for a lot of people who have been working on the ground to be involved in the development of those laws and policies. So I think that's the positive part. Mm. The negative part is that we have a lot of problem with implementation. Um, not only in terms of resources that are allocated to the implementation, but the mindset that goes behind implementation, prim primarily from government structures. So we have legislation in place that deals with sexual violence in particular. Mm -hmm which is uh, people commonly refer to it as the Sexual Offences Act. There's a very long name for it, um, but generally people refer to it as the Sexual Offences Act. Then we have legislation specifically for domestic violence, mm -hmm. which deals primarily with the processes in terms of which people, or women in particular, but people, can get protection um, through legal processes, protection orders, um, in the ways that hopefully protect them from abusers, so the legal system steps in to, to assist them. Then we have trafficking legislation, to, so that's the Trafficking in Persons um, Act, which is around the prevention or the criminalization of trafficking. We have other pieces of legislation, uh, in particular to protect women, at least, sorry, to protect children, mm -hmm. so that's the Children's Act. We have uh, a piece of legislation that deals specifically with provision of maintenance. So that's, you know, broadly, I'm sure there may be others that I'm, that I'm missing out on, but, um, you know, broadly we have a lot of legislation in place. Um, the problems are that um, how to implement them, and then also the fact of the matter is that we have very high levels of violence, mm -hmm. which doesn't matter how much legislation you have in place, mm -hmm. we've got to deal with the causes and, and how to prevent the violence in the first place. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jennifer, I just want to move over to you because uh, the Commission for Gender Equality is a um, is a government department. Am I am I correct? No. Or I know Chapter Nine institution, and you know what? Yes. I'm not quite sure what that means. So could you sort of let us know, sure. and then also tell us what the Commission for Gender and Equality does? Sure. Yes. 
So a Chapter 9 institution just means you're established in, the, in terms of the constitution in Chapter 9. We're part of um, institutions called the Institution Supporting Democracy. So that includes the Human Rights Commission, the Public Protector, the Auditor General, the Independent Electoral Commission. And the job of these institutions is, as they say, to support democracy. So that's making sure that the role players within government and the private sector and civil society that should be play, working together and playing a role um, for in our case to address gender inequality are working well together and um, we also have a duty to look at how we're performing in terms of international treaties and agreements that South okay. Africa has signed which supplement our law and policy and um, we have the ability to monitor um, law we have a duty to do public education to make sure people are informed about the law um, and we also have the ability to commission or to comment on research that's been done so if you look at our website, there's quite a lot of information in terms of what research we've done over the last, and most recently, five years, I think, is, is commonly on our website. But obviously, a huge amount of research being done before that since we've been in operation since 1997. Mm -hmm. um, so our job is really to be, I think, what we're thinking of it at the moment is a catalyst to try and unlock the points of the system that are not working, to point them out, to monitor them, and to try and get the partners in the room to talk about how we can make them work better. And, and what is the Commission for Gender Equality sort of to uh, general people on the street? Would we engage with the, with the institution at yeah, all? Absolutely. We have, um, you have the right to make a complaint to us if you're experiencing any form of gender discrimination. And we have an online form. You can call us. We have an office in every single province. You can write a written submission to us. So any way that you can complain, you can raise your issue for us on Twitter, just making sure to take care of yourself in that process. Once you put something out in the public, it's out there. So maybe just flag to us that you'd like us to reach out to you in a more um, safe way, I suppose would be how I'd think of it. Um, but yes, absolutely, any normal person can report to us, any person in society, any person in a business. If you'd like to whistleblow, you're welcome to contact us. If, for example, we find that your complaint is actually about a broader human rights issue, we might assist you in referring it on to for the Human Rights Commission, for example, or to the police as well, if necessary. So we have a really strong legal team who deal with a lot of complaints every year, and please do make them to us. We are here for you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And then, Annika, I want to come back to you. So we're going to start with uh, the total shutdown. Okay. There was a massive march last year. Um, it was described as a group of ordinary women who were tired of seeing all these reports of women and children murdered and decided to do something about it. Um, and what that led to was sort of the gender summit yes. that's been shown. So could you okay. just give us uh, a brief rundown of how it started and what's been done since the March of last year, which was in August, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, August 1st was uh, the total shutdown March and it, it truly was started by ordinary women who had seen one too many posts of, uh, I think if you recall uh, last year, June, July, we had a series of about six weeks where we would see a picture of a woman who's gone missing. Mm -hmm. A week later, she would be found dead. Three days later, the same boyfriend, husband who was helping to look for her would be the one um, accused of having mm -hmm. uh, murdered her. And this continued for you know quite an intense uh, period uh, mid uh, last year. And I think that you know a lot of women felt they had seen one too many of these posts. The public outrage just comes on, and it sort of dies after you know the guy is arrested. Mm -hmm. And we needed to really uh, call the public uh, to this attention. The, the narrative in the media was that we are more aware of these because of social media. But what, what we know now, when you look at the stats that came out from the police, mm -hmm. is that it was actually not just because of social media there were actually more women who were being murdered uh, by their partners. So we came together initially uh, online via Facebook with a group that uh, grew to 100,000 in a matter of six weeks, and then embarked on reaching out to offline communities, uh, doing pop-up protests uh, in places like Alex in uh, Johannesburg. We visited the farms, uh, the wine farms in, in the Cape area. And nationally, the movement just started really going beyond just being online to reaching women who were uh, not necessarily uh, in the online community. When we had the march, we developed the, the 24 demands that were actually mm -hmm. delivered uh, at the marches. We, we targeted 
three main areas, even though we ended up having more marches than just those three. We wanted to march to Parliament because we felt that there was a need uh, for legislators to pay attention to updating the laws and making sure that uh, they hold administration uh, accountable mm -hmm. for implementing some of the laws that have been passed. We targeted going to the uh, Supreme Court of uh, uh, appe appeals mm -hmm. in Bloemfontein because the justice system has been problematic uh, in this. We've had situations where a judge has basically in his um, uh, in, in talking about the sentencing, saying that I'm giving you, I'm not giving maximum sentence because the girl had already uh, had sex before. She was not a virgin, like that's supposed to even matter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we targeted going to the administration because we felt that we needed accountability at the highest level of office in this country. Uh, and we needed uh, the president in particular to be the one who leads uh, to send this message of zero, zero tolerance that we needed. So the 24 demands were actually uh, developed as uh, basically through crowdsourcing. Uh, there was an open document, uh, different organizations contributed to it, individuals contributed to it, and eventually it came up to 24 demands. And it was 24 because at the time we were 24 years into our independence, okay. and we felt that each demand represented each year that the state had failed to grant women their constitutional right to safety. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the first demand asked for the president to convene a summit on uh, gender-based violence and femicide. And that's what actually took place in November. And from the summit, uh, one of the summit declarations was uh, the creation of uh, a, a gender-based violence council, mm -hmm. uh, who's interim, I'm currently serving on the interim uh, steering committee that will then be replaced, hopefully, by the, the you know, the ones that finalize the council that would be in charge of uh, coordination mm -hmm. and accountability. Because just like uh, we've already had, the issue is, is not so much the laws. Yes, there's some improvement that could be done on the laws, but the biggest challenge is implementation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we can't continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different, you know, outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so having a different coordinating body that has certain powers to hold individuals accountable who have been charged with the responsibility of implementing. You know, we, we hear now that the president has put money into the, um, this urgent action uh, to respond to GBV. But the reality of it is that this is money that's coming from the current budget that had already been budgeted for GBV to different departments. So how are we to expect the very same department, same individuals who were charged with this responsibility but failed to act, but somehow now, because this 1.1 is programmed and put in a different place, um, that somehow we expect them to act. So there needs to be uh, a greater emphasis on accountability and coordination to actually make sure that things that um, you know, women have asked for actually begin to happen. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, I want to come back to you because isn't that part of uh, the commission's role? Yeah, I mean, monitoring and oversight is part of our role. It's part of a number of government departments' roles. Um, it would be, I don't think that we're at any risk of duplication in terms of the council, but what I do think is that the council itself also requires some sort of oversight. So when, we, when there were consultations this year on the National Strategic Plan, one of the recommendations that we as the CGE made was around parliamentary oversight mm -hmm. of the council. And I think after the joint sitting, which I'm sure we're going to talk about later, recently that the president called, thinking about how we've got all of these emergency measures, we've got all these laws, we've got all these plans, but we're hearing one department going to one portfolio committee at Parliament, one going to another, and they tell one this and they tell one that. Mm -hmm. When, if we had a joint meeting, a joint oversight committee on gender-based violence that could look at both the work of the council and individual departments and how civil society is doing a lot of government work around this, we would have a stronger sense of what is going on, and I think the CGE would be one of the partners in that. It's absolutely impossible for any one entity to do it by itself. I mean, the council itself is going to face a number of um, structural difficulties in the way things work in our criminal justice system. But I think we're really not seeing it as a duplication, but something that we'd like to partner and be involved with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so one question 
to follow on that is the national strategic plan, though, is not new. Yeah. Right. D just for some context, um, yeah. what we've seen is that it's been coming on for a while, but it seems sort of to have been activated by the total shutdown. Is that correct, or what has been happening? So between 2013 and 2018, the Department of Social Development was responsible for what was called the Program of Action on Violence Against Women and Children 2013 to, it was 2013 to 2018, and then it became 2014 to 2019, the time frame shifted a bit. And that plan was being revised during the course of last year, with the, um, based on research that had showed it to be ineffective, poorly coordinated, the same challenges that we see with a number of plans. Um, so that process was almost at completion when the, no the total shutdown happened, and then the call was for a national strategic plan. And I think the feeling amongst lawmakers and policymakers at that time was that they couldn't proceed with something that, although it had been widely consulted on, had now not been consulted on by a, as broad a group of stakeholders as the total shutdown was um, envisioning. So that process was then paused, though that document I think is complete, to build on a new national strategic plan. So this is, it's not like we've never had a plan. It's just that the plan has not always been implemented, not all stakeholders have bought into it. And when I say stakeholders, I mean from within government and outside of government. So there is, there's a lot of challenge around whose responsibility it is to run with the plan. There's territory. We also have an interministerial committee that was set up in 2012 or 13 around violence. So there isn't, the absence is not that people are thinking or planning or trying to respond. The absence is that those, those efforts are not coordinated and they're very rarely properly resourced. So, um, Bronwyn, so we're talking about stakeholders that are sort of uh, not properly coordinated. I know this is one thing we also see in the justice system. Um, I find it particularly interesting that we're in cases of assault, there are so many different role players mm. um, when you move into the justice system mm. from the moment of reporting, which is either uh, the Department of Social Development, social workers or police, mm. to then prosecutors, mm -hmm. to clerks, etc. cetera. Um, how does this, uh, this lack of coordination translate to the actual process mm. on the ground? Look, you know, I, th I think one of the things that needs to be very carefully looked at is that the criminal justice system is set up by um, the thinking that works for the system as opposed to that works for victims. And um, I use the word victims, but I mean, I will, I will obviously include an acknowledgement that um, some preferable terms also are survivors. But in terms of victims and survivors, People are outside the system, we live our daily lives until we have to engage with the system. Um, so we don't prepare ourselves for engaging in a system that hopefully we would never want to use or never have to use. But the problem is as soon as we engage with the system, the system is set up for um, a way of working that works for it, that is efficient according to it. So it works for police, it works for prosecutors, it works for magistrates, it works for clerks of the court because they have bureaucratic systems in place that make the working of their system quite smooth. What it doesn't work for is victims. And when victims engage with the system, it jars, it jars very badly. Because one lands up, if I am a victim, I land up going from one role player to the next. The role players, first of all, practically don't come to me. I go to one after the next. And each one fulfills its particular role. And once a police officer believes that he or she has fulfilled his or her role, then that's the end of the line for them, and they simply pass the victim on to the next role player. Mm -hmm. And I think, like I was saying earlier on, that although we have lots of systems, laws, policies, procedures in place, what isn't working is a proper mindset shift. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can really see that if we do comparable, uh, comparative um, work in, in, in other systems, some of the systems that work better than ours are systems where people have become more empathetic. Mm -hmm. And it may sound quite basic. You know, we talk about laws and we talk about policies and we've got to get all of those things right. Uh, we do have to get those things right. We do have to get our national, natural, uh, national strategic plan right. Of course we do. But I think it's also about being a human being in the process mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a victim, that you deal with them in a way that really acknowledges what they've been through and understands. And we speak about 
believing women, and we speak about believing children, but we've got to put that into practice. Mm -hmm. The irony of what I think goes on in the system at the moment is that we encourage women to come forward, we encourage women to speak out, we say, talk about the abuse, expose it. Yet once they go into the system, the system disbelieves them. Mm -hmm. So what are the real incentives of coming forward? Um, and although I do believe that the more people that come forward, we can, we can push the system and we can challenge the system until we have a system that is made up of people that really do understand the complexities of violence, we're going to alienate victims from that process. Mm -hmm. okay. It's almost like uh, if it were a private business, you would say, make it user-centered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back after this. Welcome back. You're watching The Woman's Show. I'm Lenina Rasul, and we're sitting here tonight with Anika Makwakwa from the Total Shutdown, Bronwyn Pithy from the Women's Legal Center, and Jennifer Smout from the Commission for Gender Equality, and we're talking about policy and legislation uh, in relation to gender-based violence. So, Anika, I'm going to start with you now. Uh, you spoke about the 24 demands before we came mm -hmm. back. Uh, this year, there was talk uh, about a few specific areas that the public were calling for and that the president himself responded to. Um, and that was, one of them was the death penalty, there was bail, there was no parole. Can you just tell us a little bit about those calls? Uh, did they feature in the 24 demands? Not the death penalty. Okay. Um, so I think where we are now is that the, the 24 demands encompass some of those more recent um, calls from the public minus the death penalty. We do call for in the 24 demands for consistent sentencing, uh, which is something that we had not been seeing um, throughout uh, to this point, and there's now a co commitment to make sure that there's you know, an opportunity to look at making sure that we have consistent sentencing, some minimum sentences for certain uh, crimes. In terms of the 24 demands themselves and, and where we are with uh, those, when we look at the NSP that is currently being developed, we see that as sort of the new home for the 24 demands. I mean, uh, total shutdown members throughout the country have been very active in the NSP uh, process, advocating, they've submitted online uh, reviews of the uh, draft NSP to make sure that these 24 demands find a home mm -hmm. in the national uh, strategic plan. And I think that's what's really uh, important is to begin to consolidate uh, these experiences. You know, yes, we have not, we've had NSPs before mm -hmm. uh, to address this issue, but I think what's really unique about what's happening now is that we have an NSP that's predominantly driven from civil society side. Um, and that's also looking at a more radical agenda. Uh, as opposed to just kind of doing things the way they've always been mm -hmm. done, right? You know, we've also tended to focus more on, um, you know, uh, treatment, uh, shelters, all mm -hmm. of which are very important. But by the time we deal with shelters, we are dealing with women who've been broken. Mm -hmm. And so looking at an NSP that puts uh, a bulk of the effort on prevention. Mm. You know, how do we begin to build a society where women don't have, where men don't have to say, I'll walk with you to protect you, where women know that they can walk by themselves and, and have the right to walk by themselves and be free and not need anyone mm. to protect them. So how do we begin to, you know, move from 16 days of, you know, activism against violence to 365 days? Uh, of leaving without violence because so we get 16 days so what must happen on the other 340 mm -hmm. something days you know must it be okay to be violent so beginning to look at p the prevention pillar in the NSP as something that's emerging as brand South Africa what mm -hmm. is our brand as a nation when it comes to violence against women a and that will you know 
uh, take place when we, we implement this NSP. The other unique part of it also is that we've always dealt with uh, drivers of violence against women, whether it be fatherless homes, whether it be alcohol or what mm. have you. But in my uh, you know, assessment, this is the first time that we actually have an NSP that also speaks to economic power mm. as one of the key drivers of the violence against women. It's not, and I'm not talking about women's empowerment, the economic empowerment. Women don't need to be empowered, but there needs to be a recognition of the economic power that needs to shift in this country. In fact, a recent article I just read, I think it was yesterday, it was talking about how the more unequal our society is, the more violent. Um, th there's a direct co correlation between the violence that we experience in our communities, the violence that women in particular experience, mm. the history of this country, and the inequality. You know, if you look at the uh, Gini coefficient for this country, there's a direct correlation to that. And beginning to have an NSP that goes beyond just band-aiding the, the issue, but actually looking at the drivers and, mm. and beginning to address those is really important. Yeah, we know also that one of the major reasons why women stay is, is money that they can't afford to sort of leave an abusive mm -hmm. home. Yes, certainly. I mean, and, 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 and it's money, but also, you know, we, we are beginning to even question this notion around women and children, right? Mm. Why is it women and children? Do we make these babies by ourselves? Mm. Why is it always women and children? And so where does uh, child maintenance issues mm. come into play in beginning to deal with this economic power issue mm. and gender-based violence? You know, mm. how are our laws enabling that level of responsibility and how is, is our failure to implement child maintenance laws, for example, mm. continuing to place women in positions where they are sometimes killed with their children. So beginning to really look at, you know, let's leave this constitution. I think it's no longer good enough for us to brag overseas about how we have the most liberal constitution, we've got the best laws on this and that. We want to begin to say this needs to be part of the fabric of who South Africa is. Let's begin to live it by having uh, you know, a commitment. And it needs to be championed from the top. It's really important. That leadership, I think, is something we have not had on a lot of things. Mm. But that leadership at the presidential level, you know, driving it all the way down, is really important to drive a message of zero tolerance towards um, violence against mm. women. So on that, Bronwyn, um, I want to come to you to actually ask. So we know that the president supported some of these calls recently, uh, specifically he looked at, uh, he mentioned automatic life sentences, bail be withdrawn in major cases, no parole, and sex offender registers to be made public. Mm. Um, and I wanted you to, because you, you're an advocate, you work in the legal sector, there are legal implications mm. for this. There's a mm. process actually it needs to go through um, to be passed. So what I wanted to know is, is this realistic? Like, can it, can it be done? Yeah. And if yes, like, what would, what would it take? And would it solve any problems? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think fr from my side, there'd be a word of caution um, on a number of levels. Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't think it's a good idea to have a knee-jerk reaction to the demands that were made. These demands, although have been voiced recently, are the reality that women have sat with for years. So these are challenges within the system that are not going to be fixed overnight mm -hmm. with the signing of a piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. So if I could just address myself initially to the uh, sex offender register. Mm -hmm. um, I think one has to look very carefully at what the um, reason behind mm -hmm. having a sexual offender register is. And you have to look at how it's been used in other countries and how it can be misused and has been misused in, in various areas. And whether it's to protect communities, whether it's to further punish perpetrators, one has to look very carefully. The reason that we have a sex offender register is to prevent people who have um, convictions against children and people with mental disabilities from working with children and people with mental disabilities once they are released. Mm -hmm. And that is for the protection of. What um, I think the President is looking at and which potentially um, may be supported and may be legally viable 
is that not only people who have convictions against children and people with disability, mm -hmm. but all people who have a sex, um, uh, sexual offences conviction um, will be prevented from working in particular environments. I think making it broadly available to the public I don't think is a particularly good idea. I don't think it's going to achieve anything mm -hmm. um, because it's open to being abused, etc. So I think that's one aspect of the register that might be open to um, change. In terms of parole, the I'm going to get back to implementation again. Mm. There are provisions in legislation, both in the correctional okay. supervision, in terms of correctional services legislation, parole legislation, where or practices where the victim is a provision is made for the victim to participate in parole hearings. Mm -hmm. Yet the Department of Correctional Services never gets hold of the victim to hear his or her view on the granting of parole for a particular offender. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is an injustice. Mm -hmm. um, I was part many, many years ago, as, as many colleagues have been part of processes of developing procedures to ensure that victims were part of parole hearings. Mm -hmm. It's never been used. Mm. I think this was in the news recently. So yes, to cut yes, you. there was a uh, there was yes, there and was there a was case. a statement actually made that they would let the victims know after yes. mm. a decision had been made. Yes, and so so you just to, to go into that and look at a specific case, mm. you are saying that legislation supports victims' voices be heard before parole is granted. Yes, there is a very clear policy. There is mm -hmm. a policy that is departmental policy, Department of Correctional Services. It says very clearly in um, policy that victims must be consulted, mm -hmm. um, particularly in sexual offences. It's actually very particular yeah. to sexual offences. They must be consulted when um, parole is being considered for a particular offender and that the department must get hold of the uh, mm -hmm. complainant in that matter, and you know, in terms of I've engaged with the, with, the, with the department in, in 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 a few individual cases, and the answer often is well, it's difficult to get hold of the victim, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, that's not good enough because most mm -hmm. of the time those details are available if you just look a little harder. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, again, we have to acknowledge that a criminal justice system, whether we agree with it or not, not at the time I don't agree with the criminal justice system, but the criminal justice system has a place where somebody is found guilty, they are sentenced mm -hmm. to a particular period of time and parole is an option. Mm -hmm. So parole hearings must happen, but that doesn't mean automatically that you know two-thirds of your sentence are served and therefore you go out on parole, yeah. mm -hmm. which to a large extent is what happens. Practically, parole hearings are simply a formality. A lot of the time there isn't really a, a, a proper hearing. Mm -hmm. And I think in sex offenders, it's particularly important that those parole hearings are done properly. Yes. And so, uh, Jennifer, in a case like that, is that something that one could complain to the CGE? Yeah, I think, but I think what's important to acknowledge about this whole discussion is that we all are thinking of the criminal justice system as a system, as mm -hmm. somehow the police talk to justice, talk to mm -hmm. the prosecutors, talk to the correctional service facilities, whereas in reality, they budget separately, they plan separately, and they're not a system. They're a series of departments that you must interact with when you're going through. So uh, what I wanted to say on the correctional services, we recently um, shared some research with the, the committee on, Portfolio Committee on Correctional Services, and in that same meeting, the department was there. And they are at 150% capacity in our existing prison systems. So when we make calls over here for no bail and no parole, what that effectively means is more people in correctional facilities. We have 160,000 South Africans in a correctional facility. We had 1.6 million crimes happen last year, so already most people who are committing crime are not going to jail. But we don't have space for the ones who are already in there. So if you're saying no parole, it means keeping people in facilities that are actually in contravention of their human rights, because whether you like it or not, when you go into jail, you don't lose all of your human rights. You still have, you should be able to have a bed to sleep in and medical care, but when we excessively filling the, the existing facilities without building new facilities. If our criminal justice system were to work, our correctional services facilities would be the collapsing point because we don't have space for all the people who have committed crimes. So we, what we do as the CGE when we get things like this, where we're not thinking systemically, is to try and do things like hearings, to have all of the role players in a room, to try and get people to think constructively, to try and unlock some of the, the gaps. But 
ultimately our job is to show and monitor and try to help people to do it. We are not an implementing department ourselves. So it's really difficult. It is what all of us do is point, guide, give advice. And we're not the only ones. I mean, government itself reviewed its own legislation. The high-level panel findings were released in 2017 already, which gave instructions on how to change the laws and what to do about it. Parliament has a women's parliament every year where these issues are spoken about and recommendations are made. Government is struggling to listen to its own recommendations and to implement those. So I think whilst it can feel very frustrating to just say point, look here, do you know, try and think about this, it's really important that we don't stop doing that because then we, we don't make those systemic connections to where we have problems. And then just to address the fourth point, mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that a lot of the issues you mentioned about parole also apply to bail. Mm. It's also, you know, and, th and those perpetrators are not even convicted yet. Yes, our remand um. detention rates are incredibly high. Mm -hmm. We really have, the justice system that we were talking before the show is a really slow process. So if I get arrested on t today, it's likely that my case may only complete in two years. So for that two years, we need to put that person somewhere if they're not out on bail, mm -hmm. if they're not out on parole. And I think the reason, I can understand the emotional and strategic reasons for not wanting to grant those things. But I think we also need to be mindful of the structural inability to implement those two recommendations at the present time. That's not to say we shouldn't drive forward and unlock. I think that's where the council will be a really important role player. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I, I think this is where we need a radical agenda, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's um, we are in a point of crisis. Mm -hmm. Eight women dying on a daily basis. A woman raped every 15 minutes. It cannot be business as usual. Mm -hmm. The same way that when we had the World Cup, we decided to set up pop-up courts to be able to quickly move cases through the courts, government needs to begin to do exactly that, right? So while I hear uh, issues around you know, prisoners and their human rights, perhaps those are the laws that also need to change, right? Mm -hmm. Um, this country at present spends 350 rands per day on a prisoner, 380, mm. right? Spends 70 rands per day on a woman in a shelter. Mm. Mm. So we need to begin to flip this around. And, and that's what I mean when I say, what is brand South Africa? What is it that we are trying to build as a society, as a people, as a nation, mm. about what is it that we value? You know, you can follow the money. If I say in our household, education is the most important thing, but we are spending most of our money on uh, entertainment, mm. you know, that's in conflict. Mm. But South Africa needs to ask itself, what does it value the most? You know, at the moment, you have men in prison and some women uh, who we are spending 350 rands per day. Mm. They have access to education, which our children have to march on the streets to get uh, fees from us fall in order to have that same access, right? Yeah. So, so those, uh, I, I'm here to say we need to begin to challenge even the very democracy that uh, we have. And that's the whole beauty of being in a democratic uh, nation, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we can begin to look at our constitution and have this dialogue. Uh, you know, we need this civic education so that we can finally participate mm -hmm. in creating this um, you know, democracy that we, we, we imagine and we want to live in. Uh, it's not lost on me that um, you know, prisoners have the kind of human rights that they have, and they should, uh, given the history of our country. But also when you look at who were most of the men who were developing these laws, they themselves are men who came out of prison. We have a former president, former presidents actually, who came out of prison one who also got an education out of prison. So it's only natural that we tend to have laws that will prioritize also the human rights of prisoners. But I think it's about time that we begin to shift that in a way that begins to deter crime. At the moment, there's really no deterrent for crime in this country. You go to prison, you get three meals a day, you have DSTV, some have cell phones we've had. So there's a breakdown in the system. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, both in terms of what's the minimum uh, requirement for prisoners and what's actually happening uh, in prisons. But we need to have that shift. It's not going to happen by us saying that the, the same conversation we're having about land, for example, it's not going to happen by us saying that, oh, the Constitution says this. We need to begin to face the reality as South Africans mm -hmm. that perhaps we need to revisit our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, in order to make sure that all 58 million South Africans can enjoy 
those rights and we are not all intimidated and bullied by just a few criminals. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting, and I think uh, I think the conversation, and especially with regard to uh, domestic violence and sexual assault, is sort of a lot more complicated, which mm -hmm. we'll go into in later shows, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, yeah. compared to other crimes. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and so, but we've got about two minutes, ladies. Mm -hmm. So before we go, I just want to say if so. If we were to drill down sort of from the broad of these broad calls that we have, if we wanted to drill it down and give an element of uh, civic activism to it, what would be your advice for citizens and especially women to sort of look at to, is it, is it education, is it educating themselves, is it trying to sort of learn the law, is it, where would you say they should foc we should be focusing on from, from a personal standpoint, what would you advise? I would always say take a friend with you when you go into the, interact with the criminal justice system. I think when you go, when you have been a victim or a recent, uh, you recently experienced crime, um, it is very difficult having been, I think all of us will have been a victim of some sort of crime, to remember everything that the person tells you because you are in a state of either shock or emotional upset. So take a friend with you, take someone that can bounce the ideas back to you on what you've already heard. Um, definitely do your best to learn as much as you can about your rights. It's still very scary when you go into a police station and they say, oh, no, we're not going to open a case for you to say, yes, you will. And that's, again, why I say take somebody with you. You can get an NGO yeah, as well. Yeah, I think I, I, think I would echo that um, because the system is not victim-friendly. Mm. And it is, on one hand, you know, my position is that we must use the system. I'm part of the system as a lawyer and that the system can work if we push it to make it work for, for, for victims. But at the same time, it's a very alienating process and it's a very alienating experience. Mm -hmm. So the more you know, the better. Mm -hmm. I would say continue to stand your ground, but I also don't want to keep s telling women what to do mm -hmm. and what not to do. I think that we need to have a movement where men are told to stop you know, being violent, uh, where mm -hmm. men are the ones who are addressed on these issues. Uh, because it certainly is not the diaper on the infant child who is raped that makes them susceptible to rape. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to go to a short break and we'll be back after this. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. That's all we have for this evening. P please tune in next week. We will look deeper into the issue of rape, reporting it, and what happens after. I'm Lenina Rasul. Good night.